Hey there friends, welcome back to the channel. My name's Alex Lokes and I have a game-changing camera review for you today. Not that my game is changing, but rather this is a camera that changed the game for Canon and the technology it introduced has resonated even into their modern digital sphere today. And that camera is the Canon EOS 650, the original camera from the EOS line. But as always, let's get back into the studio. I can give you a background of where it came from, give you a tour of the camera itself, and of course, how to use it in general terms. And I will see you right back here. Some of the first examples of practically applied autofocus in cameras started arriving in the late 1970s, notably with Konica's C35AF. Now, this used a autofocus system developed by Honeywell called Visitronic, and it used a pair of photodiodes that sort of worked like a rangefinder did in the past with widely spaced sensors, mirrors, and of course, a processor chip. Canon, however, wanted something a little more usable, a little more active. So they developed an active autofocus system, which they released with the Autoboy, or AF35M, in 1979. SLRs, on the other hand, remained in the realms of manual focus, at least until the 1980s, with both Pentax and Nikon starting to develop their own autofocus systems using their existing K and F mounts. The resulting cameras were the Pentax MEF and the Nikon F3AF, but both systems were really dead end. Canon however, wanted to take things a little bit slower. So in 1982, they released the AL-1. Now the AL-1 is unique in the sense that it wasn't autofocus, but it used a similar system that could allow it to become an autofocus. This quick focus system used a pair of CCD sensors in the base of the camera that read distance information through a semi-silvered mirror with a special etched pattern. This would allow any photographer to mount any FD lens onto the camera and be able to help them with focusing. Of course, we all know what happened in 1985 when Minolta released the Maxim 7000. Canon's response came a few months after the 7000 was released in the form of the T80. The T80 used that same focus assist system as the AL-1, but also added a pair, several um, modified FD lenses called the AC mount. When you mounted an AC lens onto the T80, the focus assist system would transmit the distance information to a motor in the lens and autofocus. And if you mounted a traditional FD lens, you would have that focus assist system. But Canon wasn't done there. They were working on something extremely special for their 50th anniversary. That came in 1987. The EOS system, or electro-optical system, introduced the world to the Canon autofocus. And more importantly, Canon took a page out of Minolta's book and built a whole new lens mount. But unlike all the other manufacturers of the time who were putting out their new autofocus systems, they moved the focusing motor into the lens rather than the camera body. Of course, they only released a single camera first, the EOS 650. This would be followed up quickly by the EOS 620. These two cameras would launch a series of, series of photographic tools that continue to this day. But now let's take a closer look at the EOS 650. And here it is, this is the EOS 650. This is a beautiful camera that takes design elements from the previous T90 and updates it a little bit more for the late 1980s. You can see it has the nice hard angles where it needs to be, this little iconic notch here, but has a nice ergonomic grip on the one side. From the front, there's really not much to see. You've got your lens, you've got your shutter release and a single command dial up here, and you have your lens release. On this side, you actually have your film door release with a safety lock. This can be a little bit annoying, um, but more on that later. 
Up at the top, you have your main LCD screen, you have your mode, your exposure compensation, and your power on. You got lock, automatic, beep control, and then the green box mode. And then on the back, underneath this small door, you have your additional controls, including your re rewind. These two buttons, you can then swap out, change out your ISO and a battery check, as well as your drive mode and a back auto focus function. And that covers it. That is pretty much it. This is a nice, simple camera and it and it shows this was a camera designed for the advanced consumer and it could also be used by a beginner quite easily. So let's go over some basic functionality. Okay, so one of the great things about Canon's EF mount is that they made the lens mounting a lot easier than with the previous FD mount that either required a twist breech lock or a breech lock release. Here it has something that's a little more familiar to you if you're familiar with Nikon or Pentax or Minolta. You have a single release button on the lens and you twist and release. And then you just line up the red dot with the red dot on your lens. You put it in and twist it. And with enough practice, you could probably even do this one-handed, but I would not recommend it. Now I did mention that the film back release is a little bit fickle and that's because it has a safety lock but if you hold it you can slide down your back pops open loading film you put your cartridge in here and then you just tuck in the tail right here so at least one of the sprockets is engaged and then it will automatically load for you as soon as you've closed it and then you simply turn your camera on using this con control dial here. Now, if you're someone who just wants to get up and go without too much thought, just twist it to the green square. This will set everything for you and it won't allow you any sort of manual override. Of course, if you're like me, you like a little bit more control, just set it to A and then you can adjust your camera mode from program, aperture priority, shutter priority or TV and metered manual. The one thing you do need to watch out for for metered manual is that you do only have a single command dial and you need to push a secondary control right back here to adjust your aperture value. Now, the one other thing that's a bit fickle is adjusting the ISO. For this, you need to go in here and you press the orange and blue buttons simultaneously and then you can manually adjust it. Now, the one thing is this camera is starting to get a little bit old, so the command dial doesn't function that easily. So it might be best just to let, let the camera do all the thinking for you, and then you're good to go. It will also automatically rewind, but if you do want to do mid-roll rewind, you do have this control panel back here, and it's just a single button push and it will rewind all the way in. But that's enough talking for me. Let's get back out into the field and see this thing in action. Okay, so I'm here in Oakville, Ontario, and I have a rather odd lens choice on my 650 today. I got the 40 millimeter F2.8 STM pancake lens. This is a lens that I've recently picked up and really enjoy working with. It gives a beautiful um, angle of view and it's fairly compact, which is weird on such a beefy camera. Inside I'm shooting Ilford HP5 which I'm reading at ASA 320 and I'm going to be developing it in Agfa Studenol. All right time's a wasting let's get shooting. The 
uh, 650 is the camera that lets me know that I'm using it. There's bulk, there's noise, and there's feedback with almost every single operation. And despite being from the 80s and the era of automation, it's a camera that makes me work for the image. There's no such thing as one-handed operation, although I'm sure with time that I could probably figure it out. The camera itself is, is really nice to use. It's well-made, um, excellent grip, fits well in my hand, and all the controls are really easily laid out. Things are really simple for this camera. You set it to A, you set it to program mode, and you're off to the races. And for me, that's what I look for in these early autofocus SLRs. I don't want to have to play around too much because it is more of a set it and forget it and go. The viewfinder, despite its age, is nice and bright and has plenty of information in there for what I want. Um, the only trouble is, is that when I want to really get into the nitty gritty, things get a little bit weird and that could just be because of the age. The control dial is a little sticky at this point and changing that ISO setting manually is incredibly difficult. Thankfully, everything else about the camera is nice and easy to use. The autofocus is fast, accurate, and the exposure meter is dead accurate as well. Totally worth it if you are into game-changing cameras. But what makes the EOS 650 a camera that's still useful today in 2023? Well, it comes down to the lens mount. The EF mount gives the 650 near universal compatibility with even modern EF mount lenses. So we're gonna go back to the studio, discuss what set the EF lenses apart from their contemporaries in 87, and discuss the lenses that I like to use with my 650. And I'll see you back at the park. So right from the start, Canon set itself apart from its competitors with the EF mount. Now, during this time, most autofocus cameras relied on the motor to be in the camera body itself and a direct mechanical linkage to the lens to actually drive the focusing helicoid. Canon, however, decided to put in a specialized motor into their lenses that allowed the drive to be in the lens rather than the camera body. This is something that only quite recently other manufacturers started doing, such as Nikon, Pentax, and Minolta, now Sony. This completely and totally went against the mechanical logic of the previous FD mounts. And it also made it a lot easier for lenses to be mounted and dismounted with a bayonet system rather than a breech lock. And these camera, these lenses also did away with a mechanical link for the aperture as well. Everything was controlled directly from the um, from electronic impulses, and we can actually see here the differences between a Nikon F mount lens and an EF lens. As you can see, the Nikon has a link for the um, for the autofocus motor in the camera body to drive the focusing and a, and a lever that controls the aperture. There are some electronic contacts here, but not as many as you can see on the EF lens. The EF lens has no mechanical link. It is strictly controlled by electronic impulses, which means that these lenses focused faster and despite having the motor in it, are lighter than even some manual focus lenses of its age and definitely lighter than autofocus lenses of its age. This also meant that focusing was fast, accurate, and almost silent, made even better when Canon started putting in the ultrasonic motor into um, larger telephoto and their L series of lenses. But when it comes to lenses for the 650, personally, I prefer to keep to the prime lenses. 
And one of the and the first lens that I got with my 650 from my great uncle George was the original Nifty 50, the 50 millimeter f 1.8. This is just a brilliant starter lens, and the best part is you can still buy them new, and they provide um, a nice fast aperture for shooting in low light and indoors, and you can stop them all the way down, and they're just generally great for a carry around lens. Now, I'm also a big fan of wide angle, so I tend to go out more with my 28 millimeter f 2.8. It does a really good job on this camera. Also, it's that nice wide angle. I really don't see myself needing any more than a 28 millimeter on the 650. It is more of a secondary camera system for me. I prefer my Nikons and my Minoltas to the, the Canon EOS line. But having that wide angle makes it wonderful if I'm out traveling or if I need to loan out the kit to someone who just wants to try out film photography. And of course, it wouldn't be an EOS system without the 40 millimeter f2.8 STM. Now this is a newer lens and it originally came out with some digital SLRs from Canon. But the nice thing about the EF lenses is that they are completely backwards compatible and I can use the 40 f2.8 on my 650. It does look a little bit weird, this tiny pancake lens on the beefy body, but it works and it produces amazing results all the same. Of course, you do have to watch out, even though all EF lenses are cross compatible, the EF-S lenses are designed for crop sensors and will damage both the lens and the body if you are mounting it on a full frame camera. Well, that covers it for this video. I personally really like the 650. It's the camera that got me started in exploring the EOS system a little bit more, and it has certainly helped. It's a great system with amazing lenses. And the best part is, if you want an inexpensive way to get into the EOS system, the 650 is the way to go. Most average about $55 Canadian on the used market without a lens. And you know what? You can probably even find some deals. The kicker is, of course, buying the battery. The battery is fairly expensive. Those two CR5 vet batteries don't come cheap. But if you're careful with it, it will last many, many rolls. And I'm still on my first battery, and it hasn't died yet. So I describe this as a game-changing camera. What do you consider a game-changing camera? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing, hitting that bell notification icon. If you've liked this video, give me a thumbs up. And as always, get out, stay safe. Don't just play the game, change it.